Okay, uh, good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, just have a couple of quick announcements. Um, so there are a couple annual awards given to outstanding UW medical students, and this year the Harry Men Award for Given for Professionalism Teamwork was given to Kyle Hancock, and the Common Award given for Outstanding Research was given to Philip Louie. We also want to thank Amanda Rue for an incredible job organizing the Lecoq Lectureship. Uh, everybody had an amazing experience interacting with uh, Professor Reinhold Gantz and his amazing work. I also wanted to give a shout out to the orthopedic residents. Uh, this past weekend, the GME Research Day, amazing representation, five papers presented by Dame Nicholson, Amanda Roof, Laura Stoll, um, and uh, Neil Teradactyl, Terabagar, <laughs> and uh, Kenny Gundel. So again, great job, guys. Uh, for the GME Research Awards this past week and uh, great research. So we're gonna go ahead and get started on Grand Rounds. Should we go ahead and start? All right, I want to welcome everybody this morning to the UW Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Grand Rounds. This morning we have an amazing panel of speakers. Um, as you know, Harborview Medical Center is the only level one medical, ce only level one medical center in the entire Whammy region of five states in the Pacific Northwest. We have the privilege of treating some of the most devastating hand injuries, including traumatic amputations. 
This morning we have a panel who will give us an overview of finger replantation, when, where, and expected outcome. The first two speakers, Dr. Laura Stoller, one of our senior residents who is going to be an inspiring uh, hand surgeon, and Dr. Stephen Kennedy, assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedics, will give us an overview of the epidemiology, surgical techniques, and outcomes for finger replantation. This will be followed by Dr. Ronald Kwan, who will tell us some of the amazing research that goes on in his lab, looking at digit regeneration and future potential of clinical applications. And lastly, Dr. Chris Allen, clinical uh, associate professor, will really bring everything together, talking about translational clinical research. One of his passions is looking at future clinical application of digit regeneration, taking all the amazing research that's done by our colleagues in basic science and applying it clinically to surgical techniques. Laura, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are excited to have the opportunity today to talk to you not only about the clinical aspects of hand amputations, finger amputations, and replantations, but then also the research side, as uh, Dr. Wong alluded to. I will be joined by Dr. Uh, Kennedy and Dr. Allen, both hand surgery, hand surgery attendings in our department, as well as Dr. Ron Kwan of the Musculoskeletal uh, Systems Biology Lab. We have no disclosures. I will begin the discussion by talking about the replantation process as well as outcomes. Dr. Kennedy will follow with some special considerations including cost, regionalization, and potential applications of telemedicine as it pertains to replants. We'll then switch gears a bit to the research side. Dr. Kwan will talk about how he is investigating digit regeneration with uh, zebrafish, and then Dr. Allen will finish with a discussion about the translational research side of digit regeneration. First, going to take you through the replant process, as I think having a really good understanding of what a replant entails, entails will make uh, the rest of the talk a little bit more understandable. So this is the image of a 14-year-old boy who amputated his thumb in shop class, unfortunately, with a miter saw. This injury <laughs> occurred four hours away. So you're on the transfer center line. What do you do? First of all, the digit should be wrapped in a uh, saline or LR moist gauze, sealed in a bag, and then placed in an ice water slurry. Digits should never be placed directly on ice as cooling below 4 degrees Celsius can actually cause intracellular crystal formation and tissue damage. Pressure should be applied to the bleeding part, and tourniquets should be avoided if possible. Finally, the patient and the amputated part should then be transferred immediately to an appropriate hospital. So Dr. Kennedy will be discussing regional transplantation centers, but in general, these patients should go to a hospital that has appropriately trained hand surgeons and has the interoperative and postoperative resources available for replant patients. Now, there are a few key elements in the history of an amputated digit. First, what was the mechanism of injury? Sharply amputated digits have the highest rate of success, quoted to be as high as 91%, whereas uh, amputations due to crush or avulsion injuries have about one-third of the survival. Know when the injury occurred and if the amputated part was cooled. And then it's also important to know about the comorbidities of the patient, including uh, smoking, mental illness, um, any atherosclerotic diseases, as well as their hobbies and their occupation, as all this will really go into the decision-making process. Most importantly, there really must be a thorough but uh, obviously quick and timely conversation with the patient about expectations. Primary and secondary surveys should be performed, especially with more proximal amputations. Uh, the amputated part and the extremity must be evaluated for zone of injury, tissue viability, and any contamination. X-rays should be obtained, tetanus updated, and antibiotics administered. There's a critical time period from the time of injury to the time of replant. Uh, the key is actually the presence of muscle, as myocytes have a high oxygen demand. Digits lack muscle, and so they are less susceptible to ischemia. The numbers that are often quoted for amputations proximal to the carpus are less than six hours of warm ischemia time and less than 12 hours of cold ischemia time. However, with more proximal amputations, there actually may be quite a bit of necrosis by two to three hours. For amputations <coughs> distal to the carpus, warm ischemia time should be less than 12 hours, and cold ischemia time should be less than 24 hours. With that said, there are actually reports in the literature of a hand being replanted after 54 hours and a digit replanted after 94 hours. I'm now going to quickly take you through the operative sequence of replanting a digit, though I can assure you this is uh, definitely not a quick process in the OR. 
Uh, in multi-digit -digit amputations, it, you go structure by structure rather than digit by digit as this is more efficient. First, you need to identify and tag the vessels and nerve ends. Uh, the vessel ends have to be carefully examined under the microscope to make sure that the part can be replanted. You should use mid-axial or zigzag incisions as demonstrated here. Dorsal veins can be found by reflecting back the flap of uh, dorsal tissue and then searching in the subdermal tissue for the veins. Or some surgeons may prefer to actually wait until there's an arterial anastomosis and use a back bleeding to identify the veins. You have to do a very thorough and adequate debridement. And in multiple digit amputations, even if you decide that a digit should not be replanted, you can actually use the vessels and nerves and other tissue um, as grafts. Next, the bone is trimmed, shortened, and fixed. Shortening the bone allows for a tension-free anastomosis as well as skin coverage. You usually end up resecting about 0.5 to 1 centimeters of bone in digit replants and 2 to 4 centimeters of bone in proximal replants. There's multiple ways to fix the bone. You can use K-wires, interosseous wiring, and mini plates. Next, the extensor tendons and flexor tendons are repaired using a locking suture. You can leave the ends free, as shown here, and uh, then go on later to connect them to allow better exposure during the anastomosis. Uh, next, you, do, you perform your venous and arterial anastomoses. Uh, you can do this in an order that's really based on surgeon preference. In general, you try to perform two venous anastomoses for every one arterial. The key to a successful anastomosis is that it must be tension-free, and when you're doing your debridement, you have to get back to healthy intima. If you can't perform a tension-free anastomosis, then you can use multiple grafts as uh, demonstrated here. Let's see if I can actually get this to work. Um, and in more recent studies, they've actually shown that vein grafts actually do not increase the rate of thrombosis as one saw or decrease the survival rate. In addition, if you're still having problems, you can create a, oh, pardon me, EV fistula as demonstrated here. Uh, and other techniques described for dealing with venous outflow include actually taking off the nail plate and rubbing the nail matrix raw and applying heparin soaked pledgets, uh, which does not sound fun at all, or placing transverse distal incisions and uh, applying leeches. Finally, the nerves are repaired and the skin is closed. You place a bulky dressing that's uh, non-circumferential to allow for swelling. Here at our institution at Harborview, we usually use a Tropicana room, which is 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Patients are usually kept MPO for about 24 hours in the event that they emergently need to return to the OR. They must maintain adequate hydration, and then you should really avoid anything that causes vasospasm, including nicotine, caffeine, chocolate, anxiety, and pain. Uh, the, the use of anticoagulation is debatable. Some people use a heparin drip, some people use sub-Q heparin, and others aspirin. So now that you have an understanding of the replant process, let's look at the outcomes. The first limb uh, that was replanted was in 1962 by Malton McCann. This was soon followed by a successful replantation of a thumb. The focus was initially on replanting all viable tissue, and now it's really turned to replanting functional tissue. Success rates were previously reported to be about 80 to 90 percent in multiple studies, but a more recent article out of JBJS out of uh, Washington University and University of Cincinnati reported a success rate of 57 percent. With regards to nerve recovery, Gelberman uh, pardon me, reported a norm normal sensation in only about 25 percent of patients with replants. In general, those with sharp amputations have a better recovery as do children. And, a recent article out of JBJS showed two factors that predicted replant success were replantation of a radial sided digit and those without a smoking history. Complications include replant failure, reperfusion injury, and major limb uh, amputations, infection, cold intolerance, and aromas. Stiffness is very common with, about pe with people gaining about 50% of normal motion. One half of uh, replants that fail will fail within the first 72 hours. Concerning findings include a two degree drop in skin temperature within one hour, a temperature less than 30 degrees, and an oxygen saturation less than 94%. A digit that is white uh, is due to arterial failure, and a digit that is dusky is due to uh, venous congestion, as shown here. Uh, this is a lady who had multiple digits amputated and then subsequently replanted. Leeches were applied on postoperative day one for venous congestion in the small finger and the 
index finger as shown here. She ultimately went back to the OR on postoperative day seven uh, for a revision amputation of her index finger only. And you can see here that she has thrombi within her dorsal veins. Most replant patients do end up going, undergoing secondary procedures such as tenolysis, tenodesis, capsulodesis, uh, scar revisions, and neurolysis. The number of secondary procedures averages about 1.5 per patient. So who is a good replant candidate? The decision to replant a part is, can be, uh, if not is, more difficult than the operation itself. Tissue viability does not mean that you will have a good outcome. Good function includes good motion, good strength, and good sensation. And in the decision-making process, one must consider the chance of survival of the replant based on the host and the injury itself, what the morbidity will be post-op, and then most importantly, what the expected functional outcome is. The goal is to restore a functional and aesthetic hand. Function should be equal or better to that achieved with a revision amputation or prosthesis. And the decision is really a balance of the patient's wishes a chance of a, and a chance of a meaningful functional outcome. A uh, wise man by the doctor, name of Dr. Hannel once said and wrote in a book, the basic functional hand includes a stable and sensate radial digit in the thumb position that can contact one or more central or ulnar sided digits. There should be an intervening cleft to allow for manipulation of objects. So basically we need to provide a thumb that can oppose a central digit and in addition you really need to keep in mind not to burn bridges for future reconstructive efforts. Replant parts in the area of greatest functional significance, as shown here, uh, this is actually an index finger that was transposed to the position of the thumb. There are no absolute indications or contraindications for replants. The thumb is usually, usually replanted even if you have to shorten it or use grafts, as this is cosmetically and functionally superior due to its pivotal role in pinch and grip. Multiple digit amputations, single digit amputations distal to the FDS insertion, and amputations from mid palm proximal and those in children are generally considered indications. Avulsions and explosions create a very large zone of injury, so those are generally considered to be contraindications as are multi-level amputations. Single digit amputations, dis, uh, sorry, proximal to the FDS insertion, those with prolonged warm ischemia time and those with gross contamination. In general, if a patient can't survive general anesthesia, they also probably should not have a replant. Multi-level injuries such as this one are considered a contraindication to replant for obvious reasons. However, if you recall on my previous slide, I listed avulsion injuries as a contraindication as well. However, this is a thumb and uh, that was evulsed off. The extensor and flexor tendons were evulsed at their musculotendinous junctions. However, this uh, digit did have good vessels and thus it was replanted to provide a uh, stable post for opposition. Our Bandix landmark article in 1985 showed that digits replanted proximal to the FDS actually only gained about 35 degrees of PIP motion and patients regarded this usually as a hindrance and thus would try to bypass their finger. Transmetacarpal and more proximal injuries such as this one uh, should be replanted or have an attempt at replantation given the severity of the injury and the debilitating nature of the injury. With regards to the thumb, Goldner has found that revision, amputation, and prosthesis provided better pinch, but a replanted thumb has better fine dexterity and a better appearance. Surgeons are pretty aggressive about replanting digits in children. Uh, there are conflicting studies about whether they have higher or lower rates of success. This is a four-year-old boy who had bilateral upper extremity amputations of his arms when uh, his arms were caught in the power winder, truck of a, a power winder of a fuel truck. He had a pretty large zone of injury in his uh, left upper extremity, so it could not be replanted, but Dr. Hanel successfully replanted his right upper extremity, and uh, you can see what a completely different quality of life this kid will have compared to being a double limb, upper limb amputee. Coming back to our first case, uh, the sum was successfully replanted. Let's see if I can get this to work. And he does have a little bit of stiffness in his IP joint, but overall has great motion in his MCP and CMC joint. You may recognize this picture, which is uh, the lady with the multi-digit replantation with a failed index finger. She also went on to have a great outcome, and you can see here too, she's uh, 
she's actually bypassing the index finger and uh, Dr. Kennedy will talk more about the index finger in detail. So I'm now going to turn the mic over to Dr. Kennedy and he's going to talk about how you take limbs that look like this and turn them into this. Thank you, Laura. Microsurgery technology has uh, advanced and spread over the past 50 years and replantation of finger amputations is now commonplace in many countries around the world. Many of the advances in technique actually came between that period between 1968 and the mid-1980s and that uh, really changed the way that we treat many of these injuries. There are also multiple implications in terms of epidemiology and systems-based practice and how this all affects things. So special considerations are sometimes necessary and we need to be creative. In multiple digit amputations, we will uh, sometimes consider putting the best parts with the best stump and we'll put the, uh, replant the digits in the most important functional location. Other times parts that cannot be re replanted can be used as spare parts to reconstruct bone, soft tissues, including nerves, tendons, in other parts of the hand. Adequate debridement is a cornerstone of any reconstructive effort, like in this case above, but we also don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. So if there's a thumb part that could be salvaged, we will consider ectopic banking of the part. This was first described by Marco Godina in 1986 when he successfully banked a hand amputation in the contralateral axilla and replanted it two months later. This has been described on the its lateral limb, the contralateral limb, the axilla and the groin, but can be done in any location with arterial and venous vessels. And uh, when it's done, the digit is kept mobile with passive hand therapy and then replanted later when there's adequate soft tissue stability to allow for reconstruction. If the digit is not viable, then uh, we often have to look at options for reconstruction to make a new thumb. <coughs> this can be done by multiple methods, from deepening of the uh, web space between the thumb and the index finger, distraction lengthening of the existing bone, or some other form of stage reconstruction of soft tissue and bone. Often the best results are obtained when thumbs are uh, when thumbs are reconstructed with a toe because of the advantage of the intact joints, intact tendons, uh, nerves, and durable skin. The second toe can be used, or the great toe, or a portion of the great toe can be used to reconstruct exist the uh, soft tissue around an existing uh, bone scaffold. Continued improvements in microscope technology and surgical instruments have also allowed for increasingly distal fingertip implantation. This may involve uh, as small as 11 ohm suture, 50 micrometer uh, needles, and no vein repair, just like uh, Laura is talking about using uh, heparin pledgets or uh, leeches. In that case, the fingertip is allowed to bleed, and it's kept bleeding uh, until the, uh, there's neoangiogenesis to allow the, uh, the part to uh, be independent of the leeches or the uh, bleeding. But even despite our advances in microsurgical, microsurgical techniques, we're, we're still conscious of what we learned in the late 1970s and early 1980s, that proximal finger replantation of a single digit can have high rates of stiffness, impaired sensation, and the person may bypass the digit. Replantation of a single digit proximal to FDS uh, insertion can impair overall hand, hand function, and the finger can get in the way because of the uh, interrelationships between the fingers. Frustration with attempted salvage of the index finger led William White to write a review article in Orthopedics Review in 1980 that I think is a great read for any hand surgeon or hand surgeon in training, and he called it Why I Hate the Index Finger. He refers to the index finger as somewhat of a prima donna in the hand world, that it's clumsy, lazy, and arrogant. It's clumsy because it's the most injured digit. It's lazy because it refuses to get involved in anything more vigorous than releasing the arrow, dealing from the bottom, pulling the trigger, or putting the finger on someone, and it's arrogant. Not only does it refuse to function, it interferes with the uninjured parts of the hand engaging in useful activity. Paul Brown performed a review of US surgeons in 1982 with a similar theme where he interviewed surgeons and asked them how much impairment they had from a single digit amputation where the surgeon actually had the amputation. And of the 104 amputee surgeons, eight admitted to some inconvenience. Some actually thought it was an uh, improvement of their hand because they were able to palm the instruments better. The reason for this is that power grip comes from the ulnar three digits. 
Lateral pinch, key pinch, chuck, and grasp can be accomplished with the middle finger, ring finger, and small finger. And so removing the entire finger, plus or, plus or minus part of the metacarpal, can provide good functional and often good appearance to the hand as well. So like cool hand Luke said, sometimes nothing can be a real cool hand. You'll notice that in that picture, it, it, when you first glance at the hand, you may not actually notice that the person's missing a finger if you weren't paying attention to it. And that's been shown in uh, research studies as well, where people, oftentimes people don't realize when people had a rate resection of their index finger. So it is a viable option. It just depends a little bit on the, on the patient too. Even in Urbanic's original article in 1985, where he demonstrated poor function with proximal finger re replantation, he still acknowledged that the 25-year-old girl with the hand in the bottom right uh, was very happy to have kept her small finger even though it was stiff and would never have considered having an amputation if she was uh, given the other, other option. In this case, this is a patient of mine. Uh, she was so happy that we were able to reattach her middle fingertip, she asked to have her uh, picture taken with us to show her friends. The patient needs to know ahead of time what they're signing up for. Uh, they have to be willing to undergo complex surgery and hospitalization and multiple procedures. The initial hospital stay um, may be five to six days, but then there's also, you know, tenolysis and other uh, reconstructive procedures that may go on for another six months afterwards. And they need to be prepared for the cost. It can be 10 to 15 times more expensive to undergo replantation versus uh, amputation. And they are probably going to have a significant uh, delay in returning to work. The economics of replantation versus re revision amputation is also becoming uh, more important. Just last month in plastics and reconstructive surgery, there was a um, uh, study out of Ann Arbor, uh, Michigan, where they looked at the cost and quality of just of life years used to calculate the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. In general, as a benchmark, $50,000 is considered to be a uh, generally cost effective intervention. And so if you have in replantation uh, of four digits, that is about $23,800, so that is a, a good deal. Uh, same thing with a three-digit three amputation, or, and maybe even, for, maybe even for a distal thumb. But once you get to a distal fingertip, the number goes up to about $60,000, and if you look at the uh, single-digit replant um, of the index finger, for example, the uh, cost effective cost effectiveness ratio is $136,400. So that's going to be scrutinized more and more as uh, cost effectiveness becomes uh, a consideration. Use of a cost effectiveness, uh, an absolute threshold to re recommend or to reject intervention is debated as uh, policymakers are reluctant to consider to cost and major health policy decisions because of the uh, fears of being perceived as uh, rationing care. It's also important not to uh, generalize. We can predict to some extent based on gender, uh, culture, and occupation uh, what people are going to prefer, but never really enough to uh, predict without having a good thorough discussion with the patient. And so hand surgeons that do replants need to be ready at any time for a patient to come through the door with amputated fingers, hands, or proximal amputations, counsel them about the pros and cons of surgery, and then do a technically demanding and tedious surgery for hours through the middle of the night. Often it's disruptive to other clinical and social responsibilities and it can certainly be anxiety inducing. Uh, I think we're like the hockey goalies of hand surgery. Wanting to do it probably makes us a little bit weird. It's hard to completely understand why someone uh, from a young age would want to stand in a net and have frozen rubber shot at them at 100 miles per hour. And uh, we're probably a little bit like that too. And that's been a challenge more recently as we've looked at this in terms of uh, research in the hand surgery literature that uh, there's less and less surgeons that are willing to do this kind of work. Um, a survey of the American Society of Surgery, uh, American Society of, um, for Surgery of the Hand found that uh, about 56% of existing hand surgeons are willing to do replants. 62% of those uh, uh, that do replants do less than five a year. And cited uh, reasons for this are uh, inadequate confidence with the procedure and disappointment with the results. Scott Levin has commented in the American, or sorry, the AOS now, that the rigors of learning to be a microsurgeon have dissuaded many young people from doing replantation. Uh, being a lone replant surgeon at a regional center is also very challenging and requires a lot of work. Here at Harborview, we're privileged to have uh, seven replantation surgeons, and so there's always backup available. If I operate through the night uh, on a Wednesday night, Dr. Allen will be there Thursday morning with a, uh, 
experienced hand fellow ready to take uh, take over and continue with the case if needs if needed. And so similarly, if we look at replantation rates across the country, 95% of replantation is performed at urban hospitals. This has an effect on replantation rates, where replantation is more likely to be performed in urban centers and more so in uh, academic centers. The replantation rate in academic centers is about 19%, whereas it's only 7% in other centers for uh, non-academic centers. And uh, uh, Jeff Friedrich has been involved in a, uh, a wrote a, um, an article on the epidemiology of these injuries and has uh, proposed that regionalization of replantation care may allow the hand surgery community to provide uh, more efficient and physical care for these patients. And as technology progresses so that people already have the technology in their uh, pockets to have high quality uh, video conferencing, this has challenged the medical community to also improve our technology in a ways that are HIPAA compliant and uh, respecting the privacy of patients but also providing high quality care and saving some of the costs involved in transporting a patient, for example, from Alaska to Seattle to evaluate their finger. The University of Arkansas Medical Science Medical Sciences uh, Center has just started the first formal telemedicine uh, program for hand trauma this January and I think we're likely to see more and more of this across the country in the years to come. One of the most uh, promising pieces of technology and probably had the best outcomes is to prevent these injuries from happening even in the first place and so this is a uh, a new development that's been around for a few years now but it's called Saw Stop and uh, there's actually uh, on the Discovery Channel, the inventor of this had actually put his own finger into the saw stop and uh, had it the stop and show that it, you know, he didn't even get a nick in his skin. And so this technology is available uh, right now to prevent these, ha these injuries from happening in the first place. And with that, I'll hand over to uh, Ronald Kwan to start talking about some of the basic science and appendage regeneration. So, so thanks, Steve, for the, for the introduction. Uh, I'd like to first uh, thank the department for giving me an opportunity to talk about some of our research today. Um, so as Dr. Kennedy was uh, alluding to, you know, basic research holds promise to um, uh, help uh, uh, patients uh, with finger replantation or to uh, improve um, functional outcomes for those in which it's an option. Um, so, you know, I think one thing that I hope uh, the second half of the seminar will help highlight is that, you know, as a department, we really have a unique opportunity uh, to tackle what's really been a big question in the field of regenerative medicine, and that is how can we use animal models with a high degree of regenerative potential to identify strategies for stimulating regenerative programs in humans? <clears throat> So just to give you a, a quick introduction, so my group is called the Musculoskeletal Systems Biology Lab, and we're a part of the orthopedic science laboratories at the Harborview Medical Center. And one of the broad goals of the group is to develop novel models of skeletal systems biology. So there's a lot of different definitions for what systems biology actually is, uh, but in general, we seek to study many genes, cells, or tissues simultaneously and try to uh, understand how complex bone physiologies arise out of their interactions. So as part of this broad goal, uh, one of our specific goals is to utilize zebrafish as a novel model for bone systems biology. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with what zebrafish actually are, uh, they're a small tropical freshwater fish that start off about uh, a millimeter in size and end up about an inch or so in length as adults. And they came into prominence in biology about 40 years ago um, uh, for their use as uh, invertebrate development. But really in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a huge explosion in research trying to use these organisms as a model of human disease. And the reason why is that they blend many of the favorable attributes of cells, such as uh, ease of genetic manipulation, optical transparency, and the ability to perform high throughput experiments while retaining the physiological relevance of an intact organism. So, you know, one of the challenges with using zebrafish for bone systems biology is that uh, they're just not an established model for bone and mineral research. So, for example, if you were to look at the publication history for JBMR, which is really 
you know, the top bone and mineral research journal for our field. Uh, there's only been two other zebrafish manuscripts uh, in, in their entire 30-year publication history. Uh, but what I wanted to show you was a few different studies which, uh, you know, we found really compelling and uh, which I think helped demonstrate why we think that zebrafish are going to help us overcome what's really been two central challenges to the, the field of bone biology. And that is the inability to do discovery-based research, as well as uh, challenges with doing in vivo imaging. So on the left is uh, an example of what's called a in vivo small molecule screen. So this is by uh, David Kokel and Randy Peterson's group at Harvard. And so what they did was develop a type of behavioral assay called a photomotor response assay, uh, where they would shine a bright light at the zebrafish. And this would induce a very reproducible flexion behavior, uh, which I'll show you right now. So you'll see the bright light. And now you see them respond. And so what these investigators did was they would apply different chemicals to the zebrafish and look for the effects of those chemicals on that behavior. And by automating this assay, they are actually able to screen through more than 10,000 different uh, small molecules in a chemical library and identify more than 1,000 small molecules with a previously unidentified neuroactive function. And so we think that these types of approaches are going to be very useful for trying to identify novel factors that stimulate bone regeneration or osteogenesis, for example, if we had the right assays. So on the right is an example of uh, in vivo imaging. So this is by uh, Philip Keller et al., who's now at Genelia Farms. And so what these authors did is use zebrafish uh, in which the cells uh, were, uh, the nuclei of the cells uh, were fluorescing. And they would image them in three dimension and then subject the image data to an image processing pipeline. And by doing this, what they're able to do was to track uh, the migration and proliferation of every single cell within a developing embryo over 24 hours. And we think that these types of approaches are going to be very useful for understanding how complex bone physiologies arise, not only out of the interactions of, of bone cells with each other, but also with the environment. Okay, so if we want to use um, zebrafish for bone and mineral research, we first needed a model of rapid bone formation. And for this, we're using the regenerating tail fin. So zebrafish actually have a really remarkable capacity uh, to regenerate their fins following amputation, like other teleos fish. Uh, so this process is called epimorphic regeneration, and it occurs through three sequential steps. Um, the first is an inflammation and wound healing phase. The second is the formation of a proliferative clump of cells called a blastema. And then the third is a redevelopment phase where the cells within the blastema then redifferentiate and undergo osteogenesis and ultimately bone maturation. So the ossification is uh, intramembranous in nature and extremely rapid. So uh, most bone joints, nerves, blood vessels, and skin are regenerated within a period of about two weeks. So one thing to note about this process is that uh, this blastema is very similar to the blastema uh, which mediates limb regeneration in newts and salamanders, for example. And in general, uh, this blastema is not conserved in humans. Um, but a uh, growing body of studies suggests that once the blastema has formed, the subsequent redevelopment that occurs recapitulates many of the same phases that occurs during human bone formation. And so what this suggests is that we can use this second phase uh, to not only stimulate factors which, um, or to identify factors which stimulate uh, osteogenesis, but also to potentially model uh, bone anabolic pathologies. Okay, so if we wanted to use zebrafish uh, for bone research, the first thing that we need to do was uh, to assess whether they respond to known factors that inhibit osteogenesis in mammals. And so for this, we uh, looked at botulinum toxin or Botox. So Botox is a closer dial neurotoxin which inhibits uh, uh, synaptic fusion in cholinergic nerves. And in mammals, it's been associated with rapid muscle paralysis and impaired osteogenesis in really diverse conditions of bone formation, uh, such as appositional growth, bone and joint development, as well as bone healing. And in fact, uh, uh, doctors Ted Gross and Steve Bain have really been pioneers in leading some of these findings, um, including a collaborative study with Sean Nork showing that uh, Botox uh, impairs fracture healing. So what we did was we, inject, we injected Botox into zebrafish, and you can see uh, down in the bottom, uh, we saw a number of interesting swimming behaviors. Uh, so for example, not only did they swim less, but they're actually uh, much more likely to turn to the left than they were to the right. And when they did turn to the right, they swam with a much lower velocity than when they turned to the left. 
And so when, uh, the reason for this is that when we're injecting the fish, you know, we're injecting them on the right sides of the body, <clears throat> and this was inducing an asymmetric paralysis uh, on the right side, which was causing them to turn to the left. So what this suggested was that the paralysis was focal. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so uh, we actually uh, used some, some more kinematic analyses to, to, uh, to assess this further, and we actually found that we can induce paralysis that was focal along both the left-right axis as well as the anteroposterior axis as well. <clears throat> Okay, so we next want to look at the effects of Botox on osteogenesis during fin regeneration. And so uh, if you look at the narrow uh, skeletal anatomy of the fin, what you see is that there are uh, about 18 bone rays, and they're lined with these intra and interray nerves that run parallel along the bone rays and emanate, uh, originate near the spinal cord. And so <clears throat> what our strategy was, was to uh, <clears throat> um, uh, inject Botox into the base of the tail and then amputate and then assess effects on distal regrowth. So I'll show you some of the results. Um, so what you're looking at here are zebrafish uh, that have been labeled with uh, an agent called calcine, which labels actively mineralizing bone surfaces. And uh, these were actually obtained in whole mound uh, using high content fluorescent microscopy. I should also point out that these images were acquired by Anthony Residora, uh, a very talented undergraduate researcher in the group. Uh, so there are a few things to take away. The first is that uh, you can see, uh, <clears throat> so you can see that if you look at any individual bone ray, it's much smaller in the Botox treated fish. And in addition, you can see that the saline treated fish has these bifurcations, which are completely eliminated in the Botox treated animals. And so what this su should suggest is that Botox inhibits not only bone outgrowth but also bone patterning. Um, but the most interesting feature that we saw in these animals was that. Uh, uh, you can see that in the saline treated fish, there's this uh, sort of uniform and high intensity calcium labeling. Uh, but this is in contrast to the Botox treated fish, where we would often see uh, individual bone rays that had a high degree of labeling immediately adjacent to bone rays which had a, a low degree of labeling. And so to us, this was actually a bit of a smoking gun because what it suggested it was that the effects of Botox, which we were seeing, uh, it wasn't arising due to any systemic uh, factors. It could actually be focalized to individual bone rays, suggesting that nerves were actually mediating this physiology, which we were seeing. <clears throat> okay, so to explore this question a little bit, a little bit further, um, uh, Dr. Amanda Roof, who's a, who's a resident, she uh, did a, a lot of this research um, in the group, what she developed was a, a novel model of denervation in the fin where she would, res oh, I'm sorry, where she would resect a, a small a hole in the fin tissue and this would actually transect uh, most of the intra and interray nerves associated with an individual bone ray. And so when she looked at the amputated fin, uh, this is what she saw. <clears throat> and so you can, it's a little bit hard to see, but uh, this is the site of transection. Here's the bone outgrowth in the individual bone rate, and you can see that it's significantly shorter compared to its dorsal and ventral neighbors. And so what this suggested was that neuronal impairment was sufficient to uh, inhibit bone outgrowth in the absence of any locomotor defects. And what it suggests is that nerves regulate bone outgrowth patterning and mineralization uh, through some sort of uh, nerve-derived factors. And so one of the things that we're trying to do now is exploit the experimental flexibility of zebrafish to identify what those factors actually are. Um, so uh, before I leave this slide, the final thing I want to note is that I previously mentioned that uh, JBMR has only had two zebrafish publications in their history, so I'm happy to announce that we just found out that they're going to have their third. Um, so congrats to Amanda and Anthony, um, who were primary co-authors on that talk, or on that manuscript. Okay, so uh, I'd like to conclude by uh, showing some future directions as far as how we can use the high throughput capabilities of zebrafish to identify some novel osteogenic factors. And so what you're looking at uh, at the bottom right here is some of our efforts which have been funded by the UW Royalty Research Fund uh, to try to integrate um, image automation with a, a novel form of bone mineralization imaging called rotopole microscopy. And this is uh, in conjunction with our collaborator, Werner Kaminsky, in the Department of Chemistry. And our hope is that by uh, integrating these imaging modalities, uh, we'll actually be able to uh, uh, image bone growth and mineralization in hundreds of regenerating zebrafish uh, in a given week. 
And what this will allow us to do is to then screen through chemical libraries to identify novel osteogenic factors that are going to help uh, overcome regenerative deficits associated uh, not only with neuromuscular dysfunction, but potentially a broad spectrum of other bone pathologies as well. So in summary, uh, we're using zebrafish as a model of mammalian osteogenesis to identify new strategies to stimulate bone regeneration. And as part of these studies, uh, we found that neuromuscular regulation of osteogenesis conserved in zebrafish. So, you know, one thing that these findings really highlight is that, you know, any findings that we find in the fish are going to need to be assessed for translational potential, uh, not only in, in mammals, but also in human physiologies, both in vitro and in vivo. And so, uh, so Chris uh, has really been a pioneer in uh, trying to take findings from lower vertebrates and translate them uh, to a clinical setting. So with that, I'll hand off the podium to Dr. Allen. Thanks for coming. I know a lot of you don't do this sort of thing, so I appreciate your, your coming to hear about what we are up to. Ron is a, a, um, a tremendously energetic investigator, and the last thing that he mentioned up here is that there's a need for clinical collaboration. I'll just say it's my bias, but I believe it's founded in reality. Regeneration is the future of medicine, and it's the future of orthopedics, and Ron is going to help lead us there, so please seek him out. Uh, if you have interests that at all seem like something he could test, he is your man. Uh, I'm going to talk about digit regeneration in humans, and the three areas I want to focus on are why would it be worthwhile? I hope I don't have to spend a lot of time convincing you that it would. What it's going to take to do it, and where we are now. So why try? Um, bad things happen, and we cannot always fix them. The uh, calf roper lost his thumb. This gentleman in the middle aspect of the slide was stamping carabiners and stamped his hand off. And the lower right is a, an unfortunately all too common motor vehicle accident uh, through the elbow. Things we can do, which you've heard a little bit about, include revision amputation with a prosthesis, replantation, and transplant. So uh, this gentleman went back to his job of record with this hook, but it's clearly not the same. Uh, there are osseointegrated prostheses, which are not yet available in the US, but which provide proprioceptive feedback. But these are just snap-on plastic parts. You've heard plenty about replantation and the rigors involved. And uh, I'll show you in a minute. I'll show you in one second that these things, this is a mid-palm replant, but if you look at the lateral view, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, I'm checking the thenar eminence there, but it, since it's proximal to the zone of injury, I don't know why I was bothering. Uh, if you get to the lateral view, he's intrinsic minus, right? So he can't flex the MPs and extend the IPs, and so that's not a very functional hand. I'm glad it's alive. He's glad it's on. Uh, we could do better. So robotics are current. Uh, and receiving a lot of funding from the military, as I have, by the way. I should note that I don't have no disclosures. I'll disclose that I've been funded by the military, and I'm grateful for it. Robotics, again, give you parts that have proprioceptive feedback and mobility, but are certainly not the original equipment. Hand transplantation is done in several centers, but it requires lifelong immunosuppression so far, and the solid organ literature, as with kidneys, shows that some percentage of those folks receiving those drugs go on to develop sarcomas, which can be life-threatening. So there's an ethical question as to whether a single limb loss warrants that sort of risk. How about the newt? These guys grow parts like crazy. They replace the lost part faithfully. And if we could figure out what they're doing that we can't do, that would be wonderful. I think that's obvious, but uh, it uncovers a host of challenges for us. And the requirements, if we had to dumb it down for me, uh, would be first, we need cells that can make other parts than the part that they are themselves. We can call them progenitor cells or regeneration competent. And they need to be there in enough, enough numbers, sufficient numbers to rebuild the whole part. And you can call it a blastema. You can just say that the stem cells. Part two, we need something that makes that blob of cells become the structure that was lost. So patterning information. And this is a big challenge. And finally, a permissive environment. We're not a newt. We don't live in the water where everything's nice like culture medium. If we shake hands with our replanted, if with our regenerated finger and it comes off, we need to start over. So how can we protect parts that are regenerating? Can mammals do any of this sort of thing? And if mammals can, can humans? Kids regrow digit tips pretty well. This little girl chopped off her fingertip in a bicycle spoke and regrow a pretty nice uh, replacement part. This was um, sewn back on with the sort of euphemistic statement that it's a biological dressing and maybe it'll adhere 
And of course, it shriveled up and became like a scab on your knee. But when it sloughed in a couple of months, her fingertip looked pretty good. So kids will re regrow, I won't say regenerate, but make new parts that look pretty good. If you think about their ability to do this, it raises the question about why we can't regenerate larger volumes of tissue at older ages. It's probably got to do with cellular challenges, but uh, there are other obstacles that are becoming clear as we look at this, and we'll talk about them briefly. But the digit you can think of as a baby limb. If you can do a digit, you can do a limb. If you can't do a digit, you're not going to regrow an arm and leg. So start there. Mice are the current mammalian model. And um, we stole ideas from Ken Munioka's group and, and worked with some cell culture to show that transcription repressors expressed in the mouse and the zone of regeneration are expressed in the human uh, in the same region of the distal tip, on the strength of which we were invited by uh, Ken to join him in a DARPA-funded group where we were the uh, human digit guys over on the right. You can see that cute little axolotl up in the upper left, and we had a host of other investigators working to try and see where we are now and where we can go. The Army is, of course, extremely interested with the current and resolving conflicts in the Middle East in uh, addressing uh, some of the injuries sustained there. So taking parts from folks like those you've seen in Laura's and Stephen's talk, um, unreplantable parts, we were able to harvest cells from the non-replantable digits from folks who came to Harborview and uh, found that you can actually get some regeneration competent or some stem-like cells out of these digits. And uh, we found that many of the known progenital cell markers expressed by uh, um, other regeneration competent organisms are in fact expressed in the cells that we were able to extract from the human digits, which had not been shown before. And furthermore, the requirements that a cell be able to make bone and cartilage and fat before you can call it a stem cell are met by these cells. So they seem to have the potential to be stem-like. And uh, you can label them for injection in other organisms. We're hoping to work with Ron to do so in zebrafish to see if they can participate in regeneration. So maybe they are regeneration competent. How do we get enough cell numbers? I don't know. Culture them and reapply them. Culture them on the dip, tip of the digit. These are possibilities. Patterning information, it's been shown that BMP2 can help regenerate middle phalanx amputations in mice. So we're looking at that. And possibly extracellular matrix, the so-called uh, uh, pixie dust. And uh, so others are working on that. And finally, a permissive environment. You need something to protect the regeneration part. We know about the vacuum-assisted closure device, negative pressure wound therapy. I've tried this after a thumb replant after a blast injury because we had no other way to close the other wounds and uh, managed to keep the digit alive, so we've tried it in other digits. Lawnmower injury, clean this up. She had had advised to her in the ER that we cut these back to the DIP joint, and she would have, of course, lost all length with the loss of length would have been the loss of all the flexors to the distal phalanx, which would have been quite a cost to her in terms of strength of grip. So instead, we put on a little vac. This, for all your residents, was the most painful part of it. it took a ridiculous amount of time to get this thing to have a suction without a leak, and you know that's true. But these things did okay, and compared to where she started, she was quite happy. And this was new soft tissue, no new bone, but she did regenerate soft tissue with just mechanical signals. Others have looked at this for isolated digits for infection and for trauma and uh, shown good effects. So we're working now with an Army-funded clinical trial to see the effects of negative pressure wound therapy on isolated digit tip amputations and seeing positive results as well. So we've been working with a group at University of Texas on a, what you might call a bio-digit to do this, and this could allow egress of fluid but also ingress of cells and factors as we find uh, things that have some benefit for regeneration. And furthermore, we might think about a bio-glove or bio -mitt for hand injuries, mangling hand injuries, which could stimulate regeneration, protect regenerating digits, and permit joint motion, whose benefits you know. And so this might look something like the upper left hand uh, device we're working now with our funding to develop a prototype, which we hope will test here. Um, finally, to close, since we're creeping towards the roundup for Dr. Stoll to bring us back to the station, I just want to say that there is a mammal that can regenerate something as big as a hand or an upper limb and do so within a year's time, and that's the deer. They do this faithfully every year. So it's not the case that our hand is too big and that we're too high up the pecking order. I think that there are probably barriers we can overcome, and it's well worth trying. And uh, many people did this work here, some of them, and thank you for listening. Now we'll take it back to Dr. Stoll. Don't go anywhere, Dr. Allen. Okay. Come back.
back. <laughs> okay, thank you all for joining us. Are there any questions? No questions? <laughs> of course, Dr. Handel is going to have a question. I see Trent, I see you in the back with a question. So in, in, in all of these questions and in, in these efforts uh, to do this, it, it seems to me that in summary, we, we want to do gyms, we want to do lots of fingers, and we want to do thumbs as far as replantation efforts for our best efforts. Now, you, you said that there was no strong contraindications to, to replantation. But would you mind telling me a little bit about, is there an age cutoff? I will give the clinical example. The 70-year-old master carpenter who removes four fingers. Is that a relative contraindication or an absolute contraindication to replantation? Yeah, I don't think there's an age limit, and I can't remember when the study was, but there was a study that looked at age, and it wasn't necessarily a risk factor. I think. Um, you just have to take into consideration maybe a little bit more in the elderly, the comorbidities. And again, if they can't survive a general anesthetic because of heart disease or what have you, then they may not be the best replant candidate. I'll just add that it's probably worth having the discussion as you've always taught us, talk to the patient uh -huh. on the uh, length of time that's gonna be required both that night and the cost of the next several months. And I have met a uh, 70-year-old master conference who said, you know, I'm gonna be fine. Let me just close these up and I'll get back to working with what I have. Also, as Dr. Stoll pointed out, if they have heart disease, they're not gonna make it through. There's no point in trying. But uh, if they have the ability to make use of what you can give them, however limited it might be, and you wanna proceed, and there are no reasons not to, then it can be of value to try. And Dr. Hanel, 70 is very young. <laughs> <laughs> Trey, I think I saw you raise your hand before. Did you have a question, Dr. Green? Uh, I had the same age question. You're still young. <laughs> that said, be safe. <laughs> uh, certainly, 70s. I don't know if I've hit 80s. Great. Thank you.